You had a very impressive season and a half in Formula One. So early in your career, people were saying you were the next Alonso, the new Alonso. That's how impressive you, you, your, your early races had been. Um, will you be Formula One world champion? Do you think, <laughs> in your heart? It's a cliched question, one that all young racing drivers ask themselves at some point. For Gilles Bianchi, the answer to that question started at three years old when he first started racing in go-karts. I mean, yeah, it, it was all fun. And the fact that his father Philippe owning the go-kart track made driving every day a possibility, but it was always fueled by passion. And by the time he reached 15 years old, he was a professional, a factory driver for the Marinello karting team. He proved himself all over the world against the best of the best. And by the age of 17, he was under the management of Nicholas Tott, son of Jean Tott, and a direct link to the Ferrari Formula One team. The days of karting were never going to last forever, so for 2007, Jules made the step up into racing cars, beginning his journey toward his dream of racing in Formula One. His first stint in a racing car would come in a series far removed from those heights, however. He would first be racing in the French Formula Renault Championship. This would normally be heralded as a learning year, nothing much expected but to learn the ropes before having a serious crack at the title for the next season. But Jules wouldn't need that, because in his maiden season, he won the whole damn thing. After taking five wins and hardly ever leaving the podium, Bianchi beat everybody to become the French Formula Renault champion. That was a fair start, I think it could be said. Next season would be a step up for Bianchi, because this time he would be racing in Formula 3. He would link up with ART Grand Prix, a partnership that would last for at least a little while, and his teammates that year included the one and only Nico Hülkenberg. The Hulk already had a year under his belt in this series and in this team too, and that did pay dividends at the start of the year, but as the season progressed, Bianchi started getting better results, and he was getting closer. Ultimately, it wasn't enough. But still, to nab two wins and third in the championship in his rookie year wasn't bad at all. And in the prestigious Zandvoort Masters, he would defeat Mr. Hülkenberg, winning on the Sunday and putting his name in the history books. Bianchi would return to the same series for 2009 and, well... Need I tell you how it went? Win after win after win. Apart from a slightly unhealthy gymnastics at Brands Hatch, it was a comprehensive and comfortable championship win. Comfortably beating his teammates Adrian Tombe, Esteban Gutierrez, and Valtteri Bottas. He doubled in a few more events here and there, including the Macau Grand Prix. However, in his two attempts at this race, he never seemed to click. He never seemed to showcase what he would do over in Europe. It was... Strange, especially given what would happen in the years that followed. But after 2009, it wouldn't matter. Because after having become champion in Formula Renault and Formula 3, Jules was about ready to make another step up. Back in a time where the FIA was more confused than it is now, the final step in the Formula 1 feeder series ladder was GP2. Don't ask me why they didn't just call it Formula 2. Bernie became deliberately obtuse once he was overrun with grey hair. Bianchi made his category debut midway through the Asian Summer Series in Abu Dhabi. And immediately, he was on the pace, beating teammates and Mercedes F1 test driver Sam Bird in his very first qualifying session and getting pole position in the next race in Bahrain. He stunned onlookers with daring moves throughout the field. It seemed as if he was playing all of this on easy mode. Of course, this was all a bit of a warm-up for the proper season in Europe for 2010. First round of that season, bang, pole position. It was a great introduction to the series, and rather fitting that he had the number one born upon his car. This made it easy to see how he was progressing, but it also meant it was easy to see him crashing. A couple times that year, he made rookie errors that threw him out of the race and straight into the hospital. He did manage to complete the full season, however, and finish the year in third place. The highest place rookie, and not all that far behind second place man, Sergio Perez. So, with the pace shown, some were expecting Bianchi to be a shoo-in for the title battle in 2011. However, it was a slow start for him. It wasn't until Silverstone where he was consistently bringing home the points. But even then, the pairing of Roman Grosjean and Dams that year were indomitable. Jules got close to the Asia Series title, but again, it was won by the washed banker. You would imagine that, despite the setback, he'd return for another shot at the title for 2012. I mean, third time lucky, right? <laughs> Wrong. That season, he would instead drive in the World Series by Renault Series. By Renault. 3.5.
series. This seems like a strange call in hindsight, but back then, this series was seen as being superior to the GP2 series. Even in his own racing series, Bernie was being outfoxed. In that season, Bianchi would be driving with Tech 1 Racing. It was a strong team, but he had some strong opponents. It also didn't help when he was disqualified from the first race for stuff beyond its control. But as the year went on, he remained firmly in the title battle. A win here, a win there always showing what he could do. Heading into the final round at Catalonia, he was leading the standings. But in that final race, it was virtually a winner-takes-all scenario between himself and Red Bull back driver, Robin Freins. Now, Freins is an amazing driver, make no mistake, but it was clear from the get-go that Bianchi was either gonna stay behind him or that he, one way or the other, would leave him behind. On lap 20, Bianchi dived to the inside for fourth place and was now clear of Freins. He knew that if he could put a car between himself and the Dutchman, that he, Jules Bianchi, would be the champion. And then, Jules was thrown off into the sandbox with the ferocity of a man who knew there was nothing left to lose. For sure, Freins was a worthy champion, but for a lot of people, in particular Jules himself, what happened left a sour taste in their mouths. It's one of the worst ways to end a championship and it was understandably demoralizing. For some drivers, this could have been the end of their story. Right or wrong, people only ever remember who won the title. But for Jules, rather than it being the end of his career, it was about to move up to a whole new level. The Marussia Formula 1 team had only really come into existence in 2012 when Richard Branson realized that he had no idea what the f*** he'd gotten into just two years prior. They had Timo Glock and Charles Peake as their drivers for 2012, and they were a fairly solid driver combination. So solid, in fact, that for 2013, they were both let go. In their place, they hired Max Chilton. The less said, the better. And in that other seat, driving alongside Chilton in Formula 1 for 2013 was, of course, Louis Razia. What, wait, who? Well, Luis Razia, a Brazilian driver who had been running around in junior racing for a little while. He was putting in some pretty good performances. He was a GP2 vice champion and he was already a Formula One test driver. And now he would be something more, a full on Formula One Grand Prix driver. That was until his funding turned up with three or four less zeros than what Marussia were demanding. This meant that Razia would not race for the team in 2013. This meant that Marussia were now in search of another driver. Bianchi had been on the radar of F1 teams ever since his Formula 3 days, and him being managed by Nicholas Tott meant that the Ferrari Lynx were there from a very early time. Back when Felipe Massa was injured in 2009 and Luca Bardoa was starting to drown in his place, Bianchi was named as a potential replacement, despite not having yet made the step up to GP2. Imagine that, making your Formula 1 debut with Ferrari. He wouldn't get it, but what he would get is a young driver's test at Jerez in December that year. What resulted from this was a long-term contract with the Ferrari Formula 1 team and the distinction of being the first recruit of the Ferrari Driver Academy. For 2011, he was the test and reserve driver for Ferrari, and in 2012, he drove in nine practice sessions with Force India, whilst being that team's test and reserve driver as well. He was actually set to join the grid as a full-time driver for Force India in 2013, but ultimately, money talked, and the seat instead went to Adrian Sutil. Now, Force India were not powered by Ferrari engines, but the Marussias were, and so, given the connections, as well as everything else that goes into making a Formula 1 deal happen, the dotted line was signed, and Gilles Bianchi would race for Marussia in 2013. He had achieved his dream of racing in Formula 1. At the first round of Melbourne, he finished in 15th place. It doesn't sound like much, but in a Marussia, of which he had only two days experience before this weekend, that was pretty damn impressive. I mean, it's a solid day out if these drivers don't finish two or more laps down behind the leaders. That's the peak engineering that we're dealing with here. The pace deficit to his teammate was enormous. Yeah, sure, it was Max Chilton, the least intimidating prospect next to getting into an octagon with an onion. But you play the hand you dealt, and Jules was dealing him a right schmack in the balls. His race pace was really impressive too, his fastest race time being quicker than the likes of Valtteri Bottas and Daniel Ricciardo, who were in better cars. He continued this form in Malaysia, being an absolute pest to those in better machinery. Very early on, this kid's potential was rising to the floor, and that was good news for Marussia, because their big battle was merely finishing ahead of their arch rivals, Catrim. 
Finishing ahead of them meant literal millions in prize money. It also gave them more exposure, better access to potential sponsors and investors, and ultimately, more money to be able to keep their doors open and their lights on. And Jules was the very glue that was keeping their crusade alive. The Monaco Grand Prix is the jewel in Formula 1's crown. If you can perform well here, people will remember you. Although, for Jules, things didn't get off to the best of starts. He couldn't complete a lap in qualifying, and on the formation lap, his electronics also went on strike and wouldn't allow him to select any gear. Remarkably, his car suddenly reanimated itself in time for him to start from the pit lane, which, in a Marussia, is effectively the same as trying to understand a Christopher Nolan movie before it's already over. His mind was on the long game, even if that meant staying behind a snail of a teammate for just a little bit, even if it meant being behind him when Pastor Maldonado deployed his by now standard acrobatic trick of climbing over people rather than going around them. Some drivers like to claim that the wall jumped out in front of me. Well, Jules had legitimate claim to that. He had to pit for a new nose, but that wouldn't spell the end for his drudge of doom. Starting his 59th lap, Bianchi was approaching Saint Devault when his rear brakes decided that 58 laps was good enough. He was hurled in to the barriers at unnerving speed and gave him his first DNF of the season. In Montreal, Jules was once again victorious in the Marussia Catrum best of worst battle. It was a good performance from the guy, as has been the case ever since he first set foot into that car. But that weekend was marred by the death of track marshal Mark Robinson. It had been the first trackside fatality since Graham Beveridge in 2001. These people are the volunteers who take time out of their weekends to make all of these events possible. I don't think they're ever truly appreciated enough, and it was a reminder of the dangers of the sport. Whether you're in the grandstands, in a Formula One car, or trackside next to a JCB. At this stage in the season, the Catrums were making life very difficult for Bianchi. Whether Marussia had fallen back or not, the reality was that both Charles Peak and Guido van der Gaard were finishing ahead of him more times than he would like. Silverstone was a slog of a race. He was miles ahead of his teammate, but Catrum again found themselves in front. In Germany, Peak outqualified Bianchi, and the quest to finish ahead of the Catrum was hampered by his Ferrari engine converting itself into an offshore oil rig. Bianchi pulled over to the side of the track to get out. He walked away, angrily muttering to himself over the ineptitude of the car he was driving. He took one last look back to gawk in disgust, only to find that his car wasn't there anymore. Affronted by his abandonment, the Marussia ran away from Jules, going the wrong way down the hill, causing an alarming amount of danger to the other drivers still in the race, before eventually being stopped by this brave advertising board. As much fun as we'd love to make of it, it was horrendously dangerous. I mean, obviously, and also symbolic of some of the luck, or lack thereof, that Jules was encountering. It also didn't help that no matter what he did, there would always be a Catrum in front of him. Even his heroic performance in Belgium, where he got into the second part of qualifying in a freaking Marussia, the Catrum of Guido van der Gaard was there, ahead of him. And in the race too, it was clear that the Catrums had moved ahead of Marussia in terms of pure pace. And then in Singapore, disaster. He was beaten in the race by his teammate. Max Chilton. Most mortal souls would not bear the embarrassment. It was a struggle to stay with the Catrums, and right now, Jules' 13th place finish in Malaysia was the only thing that was keeping Marussia ahead in the constructor's standings. Catrum were getting uncomfortably close to beating that. At the Japanese Grand Prix, Bianchi's race was over before it really began. He and Van der Gaard colliding at the first corner and taking them both out of the race. It was a tragic weekend for Marussia, not so much for what happened here, but for something else. Just before the weekend commenced, the team's former test driver, Maria De Velotta, succumbed to injuries sustained in a testing crash the previous year. The team would have been hoping for a good result, but alas, it all came to naught. The rest of that year was a bit of a drudge for Bianchi. There wasn't much he could do with a car that was as slow as it was, but he still did the best that he could with it. And in the end, Marussia did beat Catrum in the constructor's standings, and of those drivers, Bianchi finished on top of all of them in the driver's standings. For these efforts, Jules was awarded Rookie of the Year at the 
the Autosport Awards. All things considered, this was a very successful season. Very impressive, given how rubbish the Marussia was. He was also warmly received around the entire paddock. A kid void of the typical ego of the Silver Spoon racing driver. Someone quite grounded. And ultimately, it was Jules' results alone that kept Marussia ahead of Caterham in the championship battle. 2014, however, was going to be even trickier. Little improvements were made to help bridge the gap to the likes of Sauber, but it largely looked set to be another battle with Caterham. And they had a new driver lineup that year, which included the highly regarded Kamui Kobayashi. If there was one thing for certain, it was that Kamui was going to take that Caterham within an inch of its technological capabilities. And with the new power unit regulations for the year, shifting from 2.4 litre V8s to 1.6 litre V6 turbos, reliability was now going to be a factor too. It meant that merely surviving until the end of the race was going to play a big part on the future of the teams. Sure, the Silver Arrows war between Sir Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg slapped that year, but the battle between Kamui Kobayashi of Caterham and Jules Bianchi of Marussia was going to be equally as juicy. They were fighting not just for their futures, but the futures of everyone in their teams. The futures of the teams themselves. A lot was on the line here. In the first round of Melbourne, reliability would play a big factor, and it went against Bianchi. Electronics played this Sunday and virtually rendered him out of contention before it even began. Luckily for him, Kobayashi threw his car into the sandbox at turn one on lap one after electing to turn his steering wheel only after his front wheels had vacated the car. In Malaysia, he set a scorching time in qualifying, going almost two seconds faster than Chilton and almost a second clear of Kobayashi. The French always were good at driving boats, but in the race, he would throw himself into the side of Maldonado's car thanks to a puncture courtesy of Jean-Eric Verne. He would soldier on for a little while until his brakes weighed the white flag on lap eight and drop kicked him out of the race. The Yankee was handed penalty points for this, the stewards deeming him to be at fault, despite the puncture having really caused it. The battle between Bianchi and Kobayashi was still raging. Not much was separating them in qualifying, and if anything, the Caterham looked to have the edge on the Marussia again. In Bahrain, Gilles once again got a little bit too frisky with another car, even if it was a car that the Marussia had absolutely no right racing against. The stewards gave him a drive through penalty, throwing him behind Kobayashi. He simply could not afford to keep on doing this. In Shanghai, they battled hard the entire way. Bianchi was in front, Kobayashi behind. On the last lap, neither wanted to relinquish, even if finishing in 17th place meant, well, nothing. Not even for them. Kamui threw it down the inside. Bianchi tried to block, but it was too late. Both of them chirping the rears under brakes. And ultimately, Kobayashi passed Bianchi in a move that A, was freaking amazing, and B, didn't count. Thanks to the chicken flag being waved too early, thus officially ending the race early. Confused? Well, I don't blame ya. Them's be the way of F1 sometimes. In Spain, the Marussia was in no man's land, but at least they had triumphed over the Caterhams. It must be said, Bianchi's performances were thus far marred by ruggedness on his end. Some would argue that this just couldn't continue. Then again, sometimes you've just got to take that risk, especially when the stakes are so damn high. The Grand Prix Circus returned to Monaco. Marussia and Caterham knew that this race would be their best chance to score points. What with the attrition race and the walls being in close proximity with the Maldonados and all. Even then though, it was a bit of a pipe dream and starting from the back of the grid is never easy. Hell, even starting from second here isn't easy. So for Jules Bianchi in the Marussia, who was starting at the very back of the grid, owing to a gearbox penalty, this was about as not easy as it could get. On Sunday, they lined up on the grid with some drivers at the back having moved forward after Maldonado's car elected to finish the race for him. In that bunch was Jules. He might have been at the back, but what he did have was 78 laps to make everything right. 78 laps to prove his worth. 78 laps to show the world who Jules Bianchi was. Lights out. Away they go. Bianchi did his best to avoid the usual first lap clown show. That took out a couple of cars ahead of him. And from there, he was hanging onto the coattails of Kobayashi, keeping himself in contention and staying out of trouble. But then, this happened. Well, that's a real kick in the teeth. A five second penalty on this track could drop you several positions. But worse still, Kobayashi didn't get one. And now he was running in 13th place. With more drivers surely doomed to perform misfortune in this race. If Kamoi kept his nose clean, he was certain to improve. And if he did, it would likely put Caterham ahead of Marussia in the constructor's standings. When Adrian Sutil disassembled his Salba on lap 25, Marussia pulled Jules in to get his first pit stop done. And in the process, get his five second penalty out of 
of the way. This was canny, given it was under safety car conditions, and thus the time lost would have been minimal. It did seem smart. Just one problem. This was totally not allowed. These penalties had to be taken under green flag conditions. The moment the safety car goes out, you can't serve any of them. So it was let known to Marussia that Bianchi's five second penalty still had to be served. They were back to square one, but because he wouldn't be pitting again, the five seconds would be added onto his race time. So Marussia and Jules knew that wherever they wanted to finish, it had to be more than five seconds ahead of the car behind them. Before the safety car came to an end, in a place where cameras couldn't reach, the Ferrari of Kimi Raikkonen came into the pit lane to replace a tyre that was punctured by Max Chilton's rogue front wing. When he came back out, he was wedged in between Bianchi and Kobayashi. Kimi had a lot more trouble passing that cage room than what would be naturally acceptable. When both of them neglected to negotiate the Nouvelle hairpin, Kobayashi was told to give up that spot to Raikkonen. And in that one moment of complacency, in that one instance of an open door, Bianchi pounced. It was a grimy, filthy, brilliant move that catapulted Jules Bianchi up into 12th place, and he began to sprint away from the cage room. He then fended off a charge from Jean-Éric Verne in the Toro Rosso, whose Renault power unit promptly blew itself to smithereens. Over down at the Lowe's hairpin, Bottas's power unit must have heard this, and thus joined him in a mark of respect. Curiously, Marshall's unalive racetrack didn't constitute a safety car, even if it was the slowest part of the racetrack. But what this meant was that Bianchi was now within one place of the top 10. He was within one place of a point scoring position. And this was significant. Ever since the new teams came into Formula 1 back in 2010, none of them ever scored a point. If one could get close, they would consider it a good day. But to actually get points would be considered a drive worthy of a god. And here was Bianchi, close so freaking close to making the impossible possible. But he still had that five second penalty looming over his head. Nothing was guaranteed and he was surrounded by cars that were faster than his was. When Esteban Gutierrez hit the inside barrier and spun, it moved Jules up into 10th place. There was still a while to go in this race, but it was now getting very, very real for Marussia. The laps whittled down and Bianchi was still sitting firm in P10. But his problem was that Romain Grosjean in the Lotus was hanging around behind him. He wasn't in any real danger of being passed by that washed banker, but he was within five seconds of Bianchi. Despite the extraordinary pace of Jules, who was already impressing just being where he was, being ahead of a Lotus which should not have been behind him, Jules was still likely going to need a miracle in these dying laps if he was going to stay in the points. Kimi Raikkonen and Kevin Magnussen tangled at the hairpin and opened the door wide open for the cars behind them. Eventually, they both got back into the race, cussing in all manner of Nordic speak toward each other. In all this kerfuffle, it was pointless for Jules to ponder the math for the rest of the race. He just had to drive, drive the best that he could, what got him into the situation in the first place and just hope that, in the end, it would be enough. Freaking did it. Jules Bianchi had scored points in a Marussia. Around this, the most demanding racetrack in all of Formula 1. Yes, other people fell by the wayside, but when you look at his race pace, it was scary. Despite being on old tyres and being around a bunch of faster cars, he was more than holding his own. And at the end of the day, he wasn't the one that crashed. He didn't make those mistakes. Well, I mean, apart from the grid thing, but eh. There is no way a result like this should have been possible. And it's precisely why this performance was so revered. All the hard work at Marussia had paid off. And with these two points, Marussia were now safely ahead of Caterham. And they were also ahead of Sauber, a team that had been in the sport since 1993. They had a good reputation and good resources. This wasn't in the script. None of it was. Jules was a hero to everyone in the motor racing world, to everyone in the Principality of Monaco, and to all his friends and family, including his godson, who himself was an aspiring racing driver. This was incredible. Amazing. Frankly, nothing can bring this moment down. Well, apart from being punted off by your own teammate in the next round, perhaps, they blamed each other. But irrespective of who'd done it, the reality was that they were both out of the race. An activity which doesn't yield any points. Apparently, as the year drew on, Jules gradually began to close the gap down between the Marouches and the cars ahead. The Caterham battle had gone a little bit flat. Now they were hunting down the Saubers and the Lotai. Germany was a good race from the lad. A little bit anonymous, but still, a solid day out. But that wasn't what most remember from that race. What we remembered was this. 
marshals running across a live racetrack to retrieve a grief-stricken car in such a vulnerable area. If one driver breaks traction out of this corner, what the hell is going on here? Where is the safety car? Are we just going to wait until the inevitable happens? This incident raised serious questions about the usage of the safety car, or lack thereof. We saw this a couple of times this year, but this, you are playing with fire here. Some may call it soft. Say that again. If it's someone you care about running across a live racetrack like this, where the consequences could be inconscionable. By this time, Jules was breaking into Q2 in qualifying a lot more often. It was starting to become less of a surprise at this point, actually. And he was really the only one of the bottom four that were able to do it. At least, consistently. Some great performances such as weekends in Belgium and Singapore reaffirmed the praise heaped upon him. But the thing about that Singapore race is that when he crossed the line on lap 60, it would be the last time that he would see the chequered flag. The conditions for the Japanese Grand Prix were appalling. The rain brought on by a typhoon was so bad that FIA race director Charlie Whiting suggested that the start time be changed in the name of safety, but the organizers refused. Honda, the track owners, wanted people in the grandstands, and the FIA hierarchy also didn't want the worldwide coverage to be interrupted. These are the best drivers in the world. Surely they were good enough to cope with anything thrown at them, they reasoned. The safety car led them away for the first lap. Under yellow flag conditions, the race was underway. Even at this race, drivers were struggling for grip. But hey, keeping the corporate sponsors happy, that's all that matters, right? Once drivers started spinning off at slow speed, the race was red flagged on lap three. After 20 minutes of waiting around, the conditions improved enough, and out they went to start again. By this time, the safety car had done its job, and it was finally time to race. Almost immediately, drivers began to pit for intermediate tyres, but not all of them, which led to the immortal sight of Jules Bianchi sitting in third place in a Marussia. Strategy or not, that was something you only ever see in video games or on hallucinogens. Eventually, he was hauled into the pits, leaving him no alternative but to fight as much as he could and to dance as delicately as possible in the damp conditions. And then it started to rain again. It started to rain hard, and it was beginning to catch drivers out. On lap 40, Adrian Sutil spun off at Dunlop and smacked into the barriers. The conditions by now were starting to reach undrivable levels, and on a corner like that, even in the dry, a mistake isn't savable. One lap later, Jules reached the same part of the racetrack. He spun off. He spun off in almost the exact same place as Sutil did. But when his car finally reached the outer edges of the gravel trap, there was a JCB right in his path. He collided with the tractor with a collision so fierce, it lifted it off the ground. The team radioed Jules to ask if he was okay. There was no response. The crash registered 254G, and by the time the marshals reached him, it was clear that the head injuries were severe. The race was stopped. This time, it was final. Jules was taken via ambulance to a local medical center. It was soon confirmed that he had diffuse axonal injury and had undergone an operation to reduce severe cranial bleeding in the intensive care unit. He remained in a critical but stable condition on a ventilator in Japan. All around the world, support reigned for Jules, both within the motor racing world and in the general public. Forza Jules was on everyone's lips. In November, he emerged from his induced coma and was able to breathe unaided and was transferred back to his hometown of Nice. It gave a lot of us hope that his condition would improve, but it wouldn't improve. On the 17th of June, 2015, Jules was gone. Multiple changes resulted from this tragedy, all for the better, but blame kept on being thrown around after this. Was Jules driving too fast? Should a safety car have been deployed when the rain became too much? Should they have been racing at all? Whatever one's conclusion is out of it, Jules' loss hit the motor racing community hard, not least of all, those closest to him. It wasn't just that we lost a great racing driver, we had lost a great human being. This whole thing echoed the tragedy of Greg Moore, another young driver who was universally liked and had all the talent in the world, but was taken away far too soon. Borussia struggled on for one more race before folding altogether. They would eventually be rebranded to Mana Racing, and they had finished ahead of Salba and Catrum in the Constructors' Championship, their best ever finish, but at a terrible cost. The number 17 was retired in his honor, and Ferrari confirmed that Jules had been chosen for the future. For the last two years, he had proven that he was worthy of a seat in Maranello. And while he never got that race seat at Ferrari, his godson did. Charles Leclerc drives on with the aim of completing the dream.
To this day, Jules remains in the memory of all those who watched him, whether that be in his days in running around a go-kart track, diving down the inside in GP2, or performing the impossible in a Marussia Formula 1 car. See, while he may not be here anymore, his legacy lives on forever. It's been nearly 10 years, but he's still there. He always will be. Will you be Formula One World Champion <laughs> in your heart? I, I don't want to say I will because it's, uh, it's wrong for me to say that. Nobody knows, but uh, for sure I won't. And um, I will do all what I can to, to become one one day. And if I can't, I would have uh, no regrets.